Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Infinity Fast Forward webinar series. Uh, appreciate you all taking some time to join us this morning. Uh, my name is Steve Kessler. I'm the uh, manager, marketing event manager here at Vertical Alliance Group, and I'll be the host on the program today. Uh, we have a really uh, important topic to talk about today, and I suspect some of you have had the experiences with predatory towing, certainly it's been uh, something that's been in the news uh, some lately. I've seen some articles written about it uh, very recently. Uh, so we're going to talk about predatory towing uh, causes and uh, countermeasures. And we have a uh, representative from the uh, American Transportation Research Institute uh, that's going to join us today. Um, I also want to uh, introduce uh, my co-host, Mark Ray. Uh, many of you, I believe, that have joined our webinars before know who Mark is. Mark's a, uh, an industry trucking executive veteran, I think uh, better than 35 years of experience as an executive in that industry. So, uh, uh, Mark, why don't you uh, give us your thoughts about uh, predatory towing before we get started here? Well, yes. Good morning, everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank ATRI for taking this issue up because it is a real issue. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a punch in the gut uh, from a bad situation, a truck crash, and, and, and you've got, you know, possibly people hurt. You've got damages to cargo. you got truck and trailer. you got, and then you get hit with a ridiculous uh, wrecker fee. Um, and it, it really compounds the issue, and I'm really glad that ATRI has taken this up. I'm really looking forward to uh, to Alex's presentation, and it 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 it's a help, hopeless help. It's a really helpless feeling when that happens to you. I can tell you for fact. So we're really looking forward to today. The causes and countermeasures. I'm really interested in the countermeasures. So I know, I, I think I know what causes a predatory towing, but the countermeasures is going to be a great discussion. Look forward to uh, today's webinar. Yeah, and uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, and before I uh, introduce Alex, our guest, uh, uh, if you feel uh, uh, that you'd like to uh, hit the chat, just let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. And by the way, if you have questions, during the webinar, you can type those into the chat or use the Q and A uh, uh, box that's there, uh, and we'll uh, we'll let Alex go through his presentation, and then uh, we'll try to take your questions and get those answered uh, uh, towards the end of the uh, of the webinar today. So, without any further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce you all to Dr. Alex Leslie. Uh, Alex is a research associate with uh, uh, ATRI. And uh, happy to say he is the primary author of ATRI's Causes and Countermeasures of Predatory Towing report that some of you may have actually seen. Uh, I've got a copy of it. It's a great uh, bit of information. And uh, before I turn it over to Alex, I want everybody to remember that ATRI is a nonprofit organization and they rely on your uh, your uh, information to uh, 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 and your financial support in order to do the great things that they do. So uh, one last thing, Alex uh, does hold a BA from University of Notre Dame and a PhD from Rutgers. So having said that, Alex, I'm going to turn it all over to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right. Thanks, uh, Stephen Mark, for, for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here really appreciate it and I, I know this is an issue that uh that you care about as well so uh always always good to be in good company in that respect uh, as i've said my name is alex leslie i'm a research associate with the american transportation research institute uh we are like steve was saying the uh, not-for-profit arm uh research arm that is of the trucking industry so uh we have a board of directors that includes executives from the companies on, on your screen right now. Uh, we're really grateful for their support, uh, among the support of others in the industry. And we also have a uh, research advisory committee, uh, which is made up of representatives from across the trucking industry, uh, from motor fleets 
uh, to insurance, uh, drivers, uh, lawyers, uh, and, and different partner industries as well that, that trucking works with. So these are the folks who help us decide, that is, they are the ones who decide for us, <laughs> what the key research issues are in the trucking industry each year. Uh, we get together each year in March. This actually just happened just a couple weeks ago. And they vote on what the biggest concerns are for the industry. And so in 2022, our research advisory committee got together and said predatory towing is one of the top five biggest issues that we need research on in the trucking industry. This is something that uh, has been a growing concern. Um, and again, that's across this group, trucking companies, but, but also the companies that do business with trucking. So that is what gave us the mandate to then go out and begin doing this research on predatory towing uh, to really dig into, uh, like the title says there, both the causes and the countermeasures. Uh, because, of course, we, we all want to know those countermeasures. But if you don't know the causes and if you don't have a good understanding of what, uh, you know, what is the contributing factors, of which there are many, uh, it is it's hard to to uh, take a good defense to this problem. Uh, so in, in the course of this report, we got data from a number of different sources, uh, which I you know I like to highlight at the top here um, because as, as Steve was saying, it, we really rely on the trust of the trucking industry to be able to produce the data that you're about to see. So we started with a, a broad survey to motor carriers to try to understand the scope of the question. Uh, we followed it up with some really detailed invoice data collection. Uh, we worked with 20 motor carriers and Elida, the owner operator independent driver uh, association, to collect about 500 invoices over a set period of time. And, and that's really what, when we get to the invoice analysis in a bit, that's really what undergirds uh, the reliability of that analysis, the rigor that, that we have a complete data set of all the crash related towing invoices from those groups in that set time period. Uh, we also went through and we did a pretty comprehensive review of what regulations look like from state to state. I'll say more about that later on as well. Uh, and then finally, defense counsel input on how to avoid or address predatory towing. Uh, and I can add to that too. Uh, we spoke with a lot of insurers and did some data collection there as well. So that's sort of the order that I'll present this information in, a bit of a table of contents, if you will. Uh, but I do want to say first, uh, excuse me, not first, uh, I, I'll just flag right now that we did also speak to towing companies uh, because we really did want to understand their perspectives, pressures on their business, um, and, and what their experience of this issue too is. Uh, and, and we got a lot of great feedback from them. So again, we want to be clear this is a real issue, uh, but at the same time, the majority of the towing industry uh, you know, are, are good operators. Uh, they're doing hard work out there, uh, and they're a necessary partner of the trucking industry. So I'll flag that up front, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a second as well. Here. So first of all, again, we wanted to know what, what are the most common types of predatory towing? When we talk about predatory towing, what are the things that we're actually talking about? Uh, and first and foremost, it's excessive hourly or per pound rates. And when we went out to motor carriers, we found that almost 83% of them had encountered this form of predatory towing at some point on a yearly basis. So that's pretty significant. Uh, the next most common there is unwarranted additional equipment or labor charges, clocking at a bit over 81%. Uh, excessive daily storage rate, 77.7 uh, vehicle release delays for access issues. Um, so again, that's that's when a company's not able to get that that truck back. 71.7% uh, of motor carriers said they had encountered this on a yearly basis. Cargo release delays happened uh, about 61.5% um, among carriers. So. Uh, that's cases where it's not just the truck, but it's actually, again, the cargo that is being held. Uh, and, and those are really two separate issues. A lot of the times when a tower is is holding on to a truck, it's uh, 
you know, to ensure that they're getting paid, they're waiting to, uh, you know, ensure that they have some kind of asset to ensure that they're going to get paid. Cargo is a bit of a different question uh, because that is, again, that is the property of the shipper. Uh, and so uh, it, it does open up a different can of worms there. Uh, vehicle seizure without clause came in at about 55 and a half percent of fleets encountering that. Uh, this one gets a lot of press. Uh, often, often we see cases where, uh, you know, in the news, a, a truck has been, uh, you know, towed without the property owner's authority or, or maybe from a spot where they were legally parked to begin with. Uh, so this is a big issue we see in the news. It wasn't the most common uh, issue encountered, but again, at 55 and a half percent. Still, still pretty frequent. More than half of carriers were seeing this in an average year. Uh, the last couple here: tow operators misreporting non-consensual tows as consensual. Okay, so a lot of the items in this list are pretty straightforward, uh, explicit. This one is a little bit less so. And one of the reasons why this matters so much is that in the states where there are towing regulations. Um, a lot of them hinge on whether a tow is consensual or not. They protect a motor carrier if it's a non-consensual tow, but if it's a consensual tow, uh, regulations don't apply because they assume that that market dynamics will will work out those prices, um, and so that that can become an, an issue. Uh, and I will say a little bit about how you can avoid that at the very end of this presentation. And then finally, damage due to use of improper towing equipment, uh, improper technique. Um, you know, this can often happen when uh, a tower is on a rotation list, when they don't really have the, the equipment to, to carry out heavy duty tows. All right, so now that we have a bit of a sense of those issues, I'm going to step back and I'm going to say a little bit about the towing and recovery industry at a glance, because like I just said a few minutes ago, uh, they do have some unique pressures and it is worth uh, it is worth recognizing that, acknowledging that, um, you know, being being fair uh, to our peers in the towing and recovery industry. So this map that you have here is uh, an approximation of the number of crashes per towing and recovery establishment by county. So these are FMCSA reported crashes and MCMIS data. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the, the federal government tracks a number of different establishments by county, and, and it does have data for towing establishments. So I should say here that these are heavy duty crashes, but not every single towing establishment included on this map is going to have heavy duty equipment. A lot of them, a lot of them don't. Uh, so uh, in fact, the, the, the crashes per towing and recovery establishment is slightly different, but, but this is an estimate here. And the big takeaway from this map uh, is that in a lot of the counties in the US, in a lot of areas in the country, uh, there's only on average, maybe one heavy duty crash that requires a tow uh, per month, uh, per year. And that's just not a lot of heavy duty crashes, uh, right? I mean, there are areas where, you know, especially urban areas where crashes are more frequent and, uh, you know, towing companies are getting more business. But for the most part, uh, the really heavy duty uh, towing equipment, you know, those 50 ton rotators, 75 ton rotators, those are not getting a lot of utilization in a lot of markets. And, and that is a real cost pressure on doing business in the towing and recovery industry uh, on the heavy duty side. A few more things that, again, just useful to, to keep in mind as the context uh, uh, to, to understand what pressures the towing industry has, because some of, the, some of this is a communication issue uh, that we see sometimes. Like I said, expensive equipment with relatively low utilization. Um, you also have consensual versus non-consensual. Those are pretty different operating models and they can have different costs, right? Uh, consensual tows, you're getting a call, uh, you know, breakdowns on the side of the road, 
Um, you know, those are towing companies that, that maybe have relationships with a motor carrier. You know, hey, motor carrier operating on this lane regularly, they're going to reach out. They're going to make a business relationship with a tower there. They're going to establish like a good, healthy uh, relationship there. Non-consensual, though, that's much more irregular business. Um, you're relying on being on a rotation list. Uh, you're working with first responders. There are extra, you know, parts involved, extra people you got to communicate, extra parties that you're doing business with. Um, and, and uh, you know, again, you don't have the same level of reliability. So it, it's a different operating model. The costs do look different there. Of course, we hear this often from towing companies that they're on standby 24-7, rain or shine. Uh, so that is certainly a cost they have to incur. Rotation lists are, are a big factor. These are the lists that are kept uh, at the local level, uh, often by uh, the, the police jurisdiction, uh, whether that's metropolitan, whether that's highway patrol. Um, and that's the list of towing and recovery companies that they're going to send out in the case of a crash where the roadway needs to get cleared. Now, depending on your jurisdiction, the standards for joining a rotation list can be very different. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the standards might not really exist. Uh, you know, in some jurisdictions, it may be more of who you know rather than what you know. Uh, and, and finally, in some jurisdictions, there isn't a clear policy for taking a tour off that rotation list if they have had some kind of predatory complaint lodged against them. And finally, like you saw on that map, in some jurisdictions, they might have to stay on the rotation list because there just might not be enough other heavy duty towers operating in the area. So uh, that's a big question mark. And again, when we talk to towing companies, rotation lists are something that they often have have, have beef with as well. So uh, in a lot of these issues, towers, uh, a lot of them that are running by the book, uh, they are they are right with the trucking industry in their complaints about some of these practices, uh, which is a great lead into quick clearance. Uh, in some jurisdictions, you have a really high priority set by law enforcement on getting that road clear as quickly as possible. And that's an understandable goal, of course. We need safe, navigable roadways. Uh, but there is a fine line there. Uh, and in some cases, it can require that towers have more assets on the scene than necessary. And if that's the case, they're going to have to charge trucking companies for those assets. So there, there are situations where, you know, you have to send out as a, as a towing company two wreckers to a crash that maybe only requires one. But it's, it's in the regulations because of quick clearance. Uh, and then finally, this is one that, that you know, again, is a concern that the towing industry has. Uh, if a carrier goes under, if they're not insured, they're kind of stuck holding the bill on that. And so that's a big reason why certainly they they have a preference for holding onto equipment until a uh, invoice is, is paid. All right. So um, I've made my caveats. I've done my, my, my justice to the, the towing industry. Uh, let's look at what some of these invoice costs actually look like. So what you're looking at right now is the result of us analyzing all those invoices that came in and finding the per hour rates for heavy duty records. Uh, so you can see on the bottom there, that X axis, uh, those are the bins of hourly rates. So that first bar is rates between 200 and 300 per hour, three and four four and five and so on. Uh, that y-axis there on the left side of the screen, that's the percentage of invoices with records that had a rate uh, in each of those bins. So for example, almost 30% of invoiced records were between $400 and $500 per hour. That was the most common rate that we saw uh, for records. Uh, but that tail extends upward a bit. You know, you do still see records, uh, quite a few getting rated at five to six, six to seven, seven to eight hundred dollars an hour. Part of that depends on where you are in the country, right? Different areas are going to have 
uh, higher operating costs. Um, so we want to give uh, you know good leeway to that, of course. Uh, what we wanted to do, though, is we wanted to identify, okay, where does a price become excessive? Where does a rate that is become excessive? And so what we used to determine this is we looked at the rates, uh, we analyzed, and we found that in a lot of these cases, we see a pretty strong cutoff uh, at about 50% higher than the median. Uh, so the median is the, the middle rate. And if you go 50% above that, in most cases, that, that covers the, the vast majority of fluctuation in local differences, equipment differences, right? Because some of those records are going to be newer, older. Some of those are going to be rated for, for different capacity. Um, but almost all of that is capped out in that 50% range. Uh, which also generally covers all of the low end of the range as well. So that threshold gives us a good idea of, okay, anything above this, it is likely to be excessive. You know, maybe there are still cases out there, right, where, where more than 50% over the median is justified given certain factors, uh, but on the whole, uh, that's going to be excessive. And so that black line you see right there is where we drew our excessive rate threshold for record. Um, so anything above 900, certainly in those high 890s, uh, 880s, that is going to be an excessive rate from what we analyze here. Uh, we do the same thing uh, here in the report with all the key equipment types. And so uh, I wanted to highlight a few of those now uh, before we get to the conclusion. So you can sort of see what, what goes into the, uh, you know, <laughs> What goes into the hot dish here is what we say in uh, in uh, the upper Midwest. What goes into the gumbo, perhaps, if you're uh, down in Texas or Louisiana. Um, hot dish is a casserole for those of you who are not familiar with <laughs> <laughs> our, our linguistic ways up here. Um, so heavy-duty rotators, again, these are going to be more expensive pieces of equipment, of course. Uh, they're rated higher. They've got uh, a much higher value to them. Uh, so... Again, it's not uncommon to see those rates be double uh, what a record is. Uh, our excessive rate threshold falls at about $1,700 per hour here as well. Um, and you can see there's a bit more variation here, uh, but um, a lot of it falling into that 800 to 1600 range. And again, part of that's going to be location, part of that's going to be what is the capacity of that rotator. Uh, Labor rates, uh, these fall uh, in a much narrower range. So labor is a much easier uh, data point to look at. We saw the, the, the majority of labor was coming in from about $75 to about $125 per hour. Uh, this is a standard laborer, not a supervisor. Uh, supervisor rates are generally about twice the amount of uh, standard labor. Hey, uh, Alex. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you're talking about invoice analysis here. Somebody is asking, is this consent or non-consent or both? This is going to be predominantly non-consent. Yeah. So these are these are going to be toes that came out of a crash. Uh, the majority of those are going to be non-consensual, not all of them. And uh, part of that is going to depend on the jurisdiction as well. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, you know, this is this becomes foggy quickly. I will say it now, though, because it is useful information to know. Um, in some jurisdictions, a crash, uh, uh, after a crash, the towing company does have the ability to choose uh, what towing company can come to uh, to handle that uh, recovery. Those are technically considered consensual in most of those applicable jurisdictions, uh, not all, in some cases, uh, those are considered non-consensual. If first response comes, they give the carrier a choice, but because the uh, police were the ones calling it out, it may still be considered non-consensual. So the exact definition there does vary by jurisdiction and the implications of it can vary as well. So uh, we stuck with your crash, uh, related toes. 
um, th there is some gray area on that is is what I want to say for the case of this analysis. Uh, but uh, it was what we found to be the at least the, the cleanest that we could get given all of that jurisdictional difference. Uh, yeah, a very good question there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we looked at administrative fees as well. Um, you know, administrative fees are a big one. Uh, the variation here is pretty significant. A lot of admin fees come in at just one or two percent. Uh, as you can see, over thirty percent of all admin fees fell in that in that bin. It's not uncommon to see them up to six percent. At that point, they do begin to die down. Um, there are a number of invoices we found where that 10% was used. Uh, but again, a surprising number of invoices coming in with administrative fees that go well above that. Admin fees can be used to, to cover all kinds of things like the paperwork, like working with insurance companies, um, managing lots even uh, on which equipment is kept. So, um, you know, admin fees, there is a place for them, uh, but but this amount of variation here shows that it, it, it can become pretty sticky pretty quickly here. Uh, we set that predatory threshold at right about 10%. Uh, and, and I will add here too, that for administrative fees and the next group of fees, miscellaneous fees, um, in order to represent the fact that this is a little bit more of a nebulous category, we used a threshold of 100%, so twice as much as the median. So the actual median invoice uh, administrative fee was about 5% of the total pre-tax bill. Uh, and, and we doubled that. So um, it's this is, this is a generous threshold. Finally, uh, the last uh, line item that I'll go into here is, is actually multiple line items. So, when you go through and analyze invoices and transcribe these things, uh, you quickly find uh, anyone who, who handles these on a regular basis, invoices are very messy. They look very different from one towing company to the next. Uh, you'll get invoices where nothing is itemized whatsoever. Uh, you'll get invoices where there's a lot of detail and, and I, you know, those, I, I prefer those. Uh, and you'll see everything in between. You'll see all different kinds of ways for categorizing rates and, and line items. And, um, we went through and, you know, we really focused mostly on those most common items, records, rotators, uh, storage, labor. Uh, but I like showing this figure because there are all kinds of additional miscellaneous line items. And, and some of these are important and necessary fees right? We're talking about things like um, oil cleanup materials, hazmat cleanup, um, you know, depending on the kind of crash that you're working with, uh, you know, a number of these line items are important and, and you know, necessary miscellaneous costs. But you'll see some of them in here are, are, are really items that should be considered as overhead. Right, I'm talking about things like uh, gloves uh, or things like radios, right? Um, some of these items, some of these items could be more debatable, but but others, you know, again, gloves, radios, saw, um, light towers, maybe, you know, some of these are are more questionable, uh, especially when the rate for for gloves is the purchase of a new set of gloves just for one one crash. Now, maybe there's some crash out there where you're burning through gloves, but uh, for the most part, um, that that raises an eyebrow in mind. So we wanted to analyze, okay, when are these miscellaneous fees too much? We know that there's got to be some miscellaneous line items, but, but when does it become excessive? Um, what we did is we added together all those expenses that weren't covered in the key invoice areas that we'd already analyzed. And we took them as a percentage of the total bill. Uh, what we found was that the median there was something like uh, about 12.5% of a bill on average was miscellaneous fees. Um, 
And so we doubled that again and set that threshold at about 25%. So anything over that we considered excessive. Okay, here's the summary of that uh, now. So, so here's, the, here's the slide that you may want to screenshot. Um, it's in the report, so you can see it there as well. But here's what we found for the median rates uh, and then excessive rates uh, in summary for, for all those key areas that we looked at. Um, so again, just we're looking at miscellaneous, you can see the median rate was about 12.5%. The excessive rate threshold, that black line is right at about 25%. Um, at the top, heavy duty wreckers, uh, 580 an hour, uh, and uh, the excessive rate threshold uh, at 873. So based on that uh, breakdown, we then went through and said, okay, how many invoices, how many of these crashes were over at least one of those excessive thresholds? And what we found is that 29.8% of crash-related tows resulted in some form of predatory bill. And you can see what that breakdown looks like uh, in the bar graph that I have here. So 8% uh, of crash-related tows had excessive miscellaneous costs. So that was the most common uh, form of excessive rate that we found. Uh, it was followed up by administrative fees, 6.5% uh, of all crash-related tows that we analyzed. Um, and then equipment rates. So that would include all types of equipment, wreckers, rotators. Um, we also used a couple other items. Uh, rollbacks were in there. Uh, a little over 6% storage rates coming at just under 5 And then labor rates, uh, which includes labor and supervisor labor. Uh, at about 4%. So if you add together those numbers, the bar graph, that'll equal your 29.8 uh, on the left side of the screen. So uh, again, a couple of big takeaways here, miscellaneous and administrative fees are, are the biggest areas to focus on. You know, uh, And interestingly enough, as I'll get to in a second here, those are areas that are either the, the most difficult to regulate or the ones that are least regulated. Uh, so that indicates partly where that, that problem falls. On the topic of regulation, then, uh, what we see reviewing regulations for the industry as a whole is, is that it, it varies widely. Uh, you've got regulations at the state level, the county level, the municipal level. So there's, there's multiple different uh, you know, jurisdictions that can regulate and even when they do regulate, we see a pretty wide variety in the things that actually get regulated and how they get regulated. So by the numbers, 12 states regulate maximum rates for police-initiated crash codes. Um, 16 require itemized invoices, not just receipts. There are some states that require invoice receipts, but if you're getting the receipt invoice only after it's been paid, that's not nearly as helpful for, for you being able to understand what it is that you're actually paying for. So itemized invoices are really what's important uh, rather than after the fact in the receipt. Uh, eight states require towing companies to release cargo. Uh, that's a big one. Certainly it's one that in the trucking industry we, we see is really important being able to get that cargo released. Um, it's one thing for a trucking, uh, excuse me, a towing company to hold on to the truck until payment is received. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, that, that's a challenge in itself, right? You're, you've got, especially for small companies, that's revenue that you're not able to make. But when it comes to cargo, you're, you're damaging that contract. You're damaging that relationship with the shipper. Uh, so this is one area I think that in addition to Itemizing invoices is an area that uh, is, is really prime for regulations, I think, to improve that relationship across the two industries, frankly. Uh, 17 states require written authorization from a property owner prior to a private property tow. Um, this is something that, again, also can, can help protect trucks, uh, you know, especially in cases where uh, 
one of the biggest issues we see in the trucking industry right now is truck parking. Uh, there is not enough truck parking, uh, not at public rest stops, not at private rest stops. Uh, it's a real challenge for our industry. And so, uh, you know, it, it's sort of some it's an issue that begins to flow over into the world of towing as well, basically. So it's something that the trucking industry needs handled. And, and as long as it's not being handled, as long as we don't have enough truck parking, it's something that that we see as a trucking industry coming at us from both sides, here, the towers uh, and, you know, either law enforcement or, you know, nobody wants to be parked on the side of, a, of an on -ramp. That's not a spot where a truck actually wants to be. Uh, they're there because there's no parking available elsewhere. Uh, 23 states support motor carriers' right to choose a towing company. Uh, so it's about half there, but there is a pretty big caveat. Um, and that is that ambiguous language in the regulation often means that regulations go unfollowed. So a state may say that uh, trucking companies should have the ability to choose. But if they have quick clearance regulations on the books as well, the law enforcement officer responding at tow might not give them the choice at all, even though the regulation is technically on the books. So this is an area where, you know, it's not important to just have regulations, but to have regulations that actually have some some emphasis behind yeah. them. Uh, you know, it's not just that we want uh, motor carriers to be able to choose, to be able to give business to the, the towers that, that they know, that they have a relationship with, but, you know, that, that they should actually be given that choice. So that choice should actually have priority uh, when it comes to an incident. So regulations that better define when that priority should happen and when it doesn't happen, uh, that I think is a key area that, again, is a regulation that I think trucking and towing can, can get on board. Uh, cargo hey. relief is another ambiguous area. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, hey, Alex, uh, you're talking about the, the various states there. Um, people are asking, is there a list of what states are involved in each of these categories or a place where they can get that information? Absolutely. So everything I'm presenting here, you can find for free in Atri's report, which includes an online compendium state by state. You can go through and find what are the rate regulations, what regulations do they have regarding uh, invoice itemization, cargo release, etc. Uh, and then finally, who you can talk to, who you should get in contact with uh, for that state. Uh, in order to lodge either a complaint or an inquiry about a potential predatory incident. So um, and we'll give you our website at the very end. Uh, but yes, all that's available. Uh, you know, you won't have my charming baritone delivering it to you, but uh, <laughs> you'll be able to reference it more easily. <laughs> and that's that's right, that's in the report that I believe was released in November. Is that right, Alex? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's yeah, anybody, sure. you can go on their site and get uh, access to that easily for anybody yep. that's interested. Yeah, thank yep. you. Yeah. Uh, another key factor here with regulations that is that there are gaps even in the regulations that do exist. So, you know, like I was alluding to earlier, the consensual versus non-consensual question, private property versus, uh, you know, these other types of post-crash tow. Um, there's a lot of equipment types, right? So a state may regulate wreckers, but not rotators. Uh, a state may regulate equipment, but not labor. Or maybe it regulates equipment and labor, but not miscellaneous fees. So there's just a lot of these gaps that require, uh, you know, some careful review of those invoices. Uh, and like I said, miscellaneous service charges, that's its own Pandora's box. There's a few different factors that, that play into uh, this problem as well. So I will say, and this is something that we hear from the trucking, uh, excuse me, the towing companies. Over deployment is something that truckers complain about a lot. You brought three assets to my, my crash site when only one or only two was, was actually necessary. Well, a lot of the times this happens because the first responders get to the site and they haven't been sufficiently trained in how to report crashes correctly to the towing company. And so the tower hears, oh, you know, like we, we need X, Y, Z. And so they send out two or three assets when only one or two was needed. Um, or if there's ambiguity 
in that first responder's call. Well, we better send out two because if we only send out one and it gets there and it's not enough, they're going to have to wait. It's going to cost more. So this is a factor in the question as well. And, and like I mentioned, quick clearance. Um, I've already described that, so I won't dwell on it here. Uh, can can also uh, also be a contributing factor here in, in higher costs uh, than what would be necessary. Insurers also play a big role here. Um, they end up paying, on average, uh, from what we saw uh, surveying insurers, about 86% of the total build amount for towing and recovery on coverage. So they're a vested party here. and They are highly interested in this issue. Uh, and so they end up contesting about 50% of invoices on average, of which they see about 51% are revised downward on average. Um, also, though, you know, there's there's pros and cons, and, and insurers procedures can delay payments in some cases, uh, which can lead to additional storage charges or or release delays on the deal. So, in some cases, you know, a towing company may be getting flack when really the insurer is the one who's who's negotiating that bill. Um, you know, in in cases here, you know, it, it's a lot of parties, it's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. If you've got law enforcement, insurers, towers, trucking companies, potentially legal getting involved there, it's a lot of different groups involved. Uh, and that can really lengthen the amount of time it takes uh, to settle one of these issues. Um, steps to avoid predatory tows. Okay, getting into the countermeasures here. Um, first of all, carriers and their insurers should ensure that they've got adequate auto liability, cargo, and physical damage coverage, uh, preferably with the same insurer uh, to avoid delays. And you also want to be aware of any towing limits, any policy limits on towing. Um, you know, there are some motor carriers out there who they maybe don't have all three of these, and that can lead to issues for towers. Uh, similarly, if you're a motor carrier and you've got, you know, liability with one insurer, physical damage with another, et cetera. It's extra cooks in the kitchen. Again, it's going to take more time to settle that invoice, which means it's going to be more time that you're going to wait on that truck. Um, and again, uh, like the question just got at, you're definitely going to want to check our compendium on state-by-state -state towing regulations. There are additional regulations uh, at the, again, the county or the local level that may also apply. So you're going to need to, you know, this is not comprehensive. But it does cover state regulations, which is a very important place, certainly, to start. A couple of data points here. They're not data points. They're recommendations on, on drivers. Drivers should photograph everything. Take pictures. Uh, crash site. The vehicles involved, not just the truck, but any other vehicles involved as well. Uh, any damage. Uh, to the area, the surrounding environment, any spills, uh, any damage, you know, uh, supports, roadway, et cetera. And then also the recovery process. That's going to give you documentation um, of, you know, any potential improper handling. And it's also going to allow you to disprove any misreported invoices. There are plenty of towing companies that, that are doing this too. Uh, and, and they do this to protect themselves as well. So uh, this is just something that helps nip potential issues right in the bud. Another thing that drivers uh, drivers should never sign consent forms on the roadside during police initiated tows. Like I mentioned, this could turn a non-consensual tow into a consensual tow, which means suddenly you might not be covered by regulations. And uh, it also could you, you could potentially be agreeing to uh, excessive rates ahead of time. Uh, so again, make sure your drivers do these two things. Uh, don't sign forms and take pictures of everything. Okay, so you've gotten an invoice and you think it might be predatory. Here's what you should do going through to figure out, uh, is it in fact predatory? Is it in fact excessive? First, look for any rates over those thresholds in our report. That's a nice place to start. Second, you're going to want to review invoices for any redundant charges or uh, a large 
number of miscellaneous charges. So if, if you see a setup fee being charged for a rotator in addition to an hourly fee, and that setup is the same rate as the hourly, uh, you know, you're getting double charged there. So that's something you're going to want to look at. And again, like I said, if you look at your invoice and you see, I'm going to charge for gloves, for radios, for lights, for boots, for X, Y, Z. If you really start seeing a bunch of those items adding up, you're going to want to start adding them up yourself and, and figure out, okay, what, what am I really paying for? Um, a good check is to look at the odometer or GPS data to compare the build mileage versus how much mileage did that truck actually travel, uh, right? Did that truck, you know, if you got billed for, for 50 miles, uh, did the truck actually travel 50 miles? Uh, you're going to want to consult police logs or, or reports on the crash scene. Potentially that could help uh, identify uh, whether damage was at the level that is reported in an invoice. And then finally, you can compare invoices to previous rates by the same towing company or others in the area uh, to check that, that that rate is consistent for that local environment. Again, if things can vary a lot from place to place. So uh, that's a good thing to check as well. Hey, Alex. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions have popped in. That's kind of a good time, I think, to address them, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Um, you mentioned uh, not very long ago about... Uh, uh, one of the reasons being that they have uh, some untrained uh, responders, people that are new. And I just wanted to read a comment uh, somebody wrote, and this is from Nick. I think that's a cop-out by the towing companies. First responders that are new are with a training supervisor and the towing dispatchers also have the experience to be able to adequately provide the appropriate amount of equipment. They are using ignorance as a defense. This is nonsense. <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that. You also <laughs> were talking about, uh, uh, I think, the limits that your insurance may have on towing. And somebody has asked, what can you do in a case where you have towing limits? Is that, I guess, something you'd have to take up with the insurance or? Yeah, I mean, that's just going to be a, Right. That's that's a nature of the policy. So, you know, you, you can take out additional policy uh, on on towing if that's an area that you're concerned with. Um, otherwise, you know, it's it's just something to be aware of that, that that is an area where you may incur extra costs, you know, at a certain at, at, after a certain threshold. So uh, that is just going to depend on, on what your policy is like. So something to discuss with your insurer. Uh, and I will say on the topic of the first responders, I mean, well, let me say a couple of things. First of all, the towing industry groups are involved in educational efforts to work with law enforcement to try to tell them, you know, hey, here's here's the different asset types. Here's how to respond in certain cases. So um it's not just something that they are saying they, they, you know, they do actually, you know, put some money where their mouth is on that trying to improve that problem. So that fact alone makes me give, I think some credence to the fact that, you know, we do see this. Um, I have heard this from some law enforcement as well, that, you know, there are areas where, you know, they, they need to, uh, you know, at times do um, additional training because the key factor here. Every heavy duty crash is unique, right? You know, you can have some really complicated heavy duty crashes. And, and so, you know, it, it's not always just a simple, this happened, so we need to send out that. You know, especially, you know, there are a lot of different variables involved in a heavy duty crash. Um, and, and some of that detail can be sort of lost in translation. So, I want to say yes, in some cases, certainly it's being used as as a cop out, no pun intended. Uh, maybe you intended the pun. I think cop out was in here. I like that a lot. Uh, but I, I do think there is some truth to it as well. So I think there are probably cases that fall on either side. I agree. One yeah. quick comment here. You were sure. talking about uh, going through the invoices and reading the invoices. Uh, Gloria says, half the time you can't read their handwritten invoices. Yeah. And the other half, you can't get hold of anybody that sent you the invoice in the first place. Yeah, 
you can say that again. I the, I don't have some little gremlin transcribing those invoices. <laughs> I transcribed all those invoices. So oh, I, man. so you know, <laughs> I know, I know. I was zooming in so much on some of those PDFs, and gosh, yeah. So I, I really do believe that a regulation regulations for itemized invoices, I think, would be one of the most useful things for this industry. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and again, I think it would help clarify things. I think ultimately it would help save towers some money as well, because they wouldn't have trucking companies and insurers saying, hey, this makes no sense just because you couldn't read the handwriting or, or because there was no itemization. It was all just one flat bill. So I, I think that's one area where, again, the industries can really come together, I think, uh, and for both of our benefits. Um, I've just got a couple more slides here that I'll speed through because I know there are a, a lot more great and the questions have all been great so far. So steps to address predatory towing, identify those invoices immediately. If you can read them, <laughs> if you can't try to get a hold of someone, uh, contact an insurer right away, if appropriate legal counsel. Um, on the legal side of things, and there's more detail on this in the full report, file a lawsuit for temporary injunction or a replevin action to regain possession of the vehicle while uh you know while it's being disputed uh, freedom of information request uh, uh can be useful for records on the towers membership on a rotation list and any prior complaints that they've had uh, on that rotation list so whether that's through the uh you know uh, state patrol highway patrol or uh you know maybe a local police department uh, and then of course file a complaint with the appropriate authority uh, in our state-by-state -state compendium, we have a lot of those listed. Um, this is our team at Atri. I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Alexa Pupilo, uh, who is the co-author on this report. She uh, was the one who, uh, God bless her, went through all the different state regulations and all of their different websites to gather that information. Uh, so uh, she was a key part of this report as well. If you're not familiar with us, uh, I encourage you to sign up uh, for our email, uh, you'll get our latest releases. We don't we don't bomb you with a bunch of junk, I promise. Uh, and you can do that by visiting truckingresearch.org. Um, I will say we uh, are always collecting data on some form of research. The data that I just showed you here would not be possible without all the motor carriers and uh, also insurers, also legal experts who uh, contribute data. Uh, right now, we're doing our annual operational cost of trucking report. This is one of our biggest ones of the year. Participating fleets got a customized benchmarking report, so I encourage you to check that out. But again, if you join our email listserv, you'll see whenever we're doing data collection. Uh, and again, that website is truckingresearch.org. So if you go there, you can find this whole report, the whole compendium of state regulations, and a heck of a lot more. Uh, so with that, uh, I see that we do still have a good amount of time for, for additional questions. So uh, let's hear them. That have been put in, Alex. Uh, uh, Joe made a comment that said, we had a single vehicle recovery over $10,000 per hour, <laughs> which is a crazy thing. And I think it just points out what we've been talking about here. There's some ridiculous things happening out there and uh, makes me grateful that this is really being looked into and something's going to be done about uh, a lot of this. Here's a question for you, though. We had a bill for a rotator for $1,500 per hour, which was within the threshold that you put out there. They charged a three hour minimum for one and a half hours of work. Hmm. Are you seeing this trend? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am seeing that trend. Uh, it, not super common, but um, I've definitely seen it on invoices that, that minimum, that minimum rate, which, yeah, I mean, especially. I will say, you know, you got to take a lot of different factors into question when you're looking at an invoice. But to me, when I see that they're already charging for, it's not over that threshold, but it's it's on the high end. Uh, and on top of that, 
they're also charging the minimum. That's an area where, yeah, I look at the rest of that invoice. And if they have no other fees on there, if they have no administrative fees, if they have no miscellaneous stuff, you know, then I would say, okay, that minimum fee is covering some of their overhead. And, and, you know, maybe that's, you know, maybe that does fall within a reasonable range. But if if they're charging for admin on top of that, if they're charging for additional fees on top of that, um, you know, then, then that's something to look at. Uh, you know, it, it's, there's a million different ways to invoice a crash and it gives us all headaches. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you see um, someone will, you know, a towing company will invoice everything as equipment and they, you know, they might have two laborers on the scene, but they won't invoice the laborers. They'll just add that in as part of the equipment. I wish they didn't do that, but, but sometimes that kind of practice is happening too. So, the moral of the story is you do want to look at the invoice as a whole uh, for better or for worse uh, when trying to assess that. But I have seen that trend. Um, here's a question uh, from Philip. Uh, you mentioned, Alex, the, if I say this right, Rep Levin process. Rep Levin, yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, describe that a little bit? Somebody's asking if you could discuss that. Yeah, it, it's a legal action. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, consult your lawyer. It's a legal action um, that uh, allows for uh, the temporary recovery of assets held uh, as as a as a sort of collateral for payment, basically. So it's a it's um, uh, it, it's an agreement essentially that you can recover your truck uh, under the understanding that the the final bill will be paid once it has been. Uh, assess. Um, there's more details to it than that. Uh, that's that's something for your legal oh, team. Very uh, but that is the that is the uh, the broad view. Very good. Yeah, it is gonna... something that is highly recommended. Again, to be able to get those trucks back rather than have to wait you know weeks and weeks on end uh, to recover your ability to do business. Very good. Uh, we got some folks here just. Uh pointing out things that have happened to them. I thought you might enjoy hearing some of these, Alex. Here's a quote from Nick. They had a $19,000 bill for a six-mile tow in Chicago for a bridge hit recovery. It wasn't the company that they called, and it was one hour of labor, according to, uh, to this. Yeah, uh, I've heard Chicago is bad. I've heard Chicago is bad uh, yeah. for predatory towing, so good luck. Yeah. Uh, Brad has said, we get minimum hours all the time. Two is the typical, but we've seen up to four hour minimums. I think you, you touched on that, Alex, but. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, like, right. I, I, I came into this, I always try to be as fair as I can to the towing industry because again, what we, yeah. I went over, I don't need to belabor it. The fact is that they have two hour minimum. Okay. I can see some reasoning for that. I'd have to look at the whole invoice, but but four hours, ooh, you know that that's yeah. when you get up to those higher numbers, it, it, that begins to become pretty questionable. Yeah. Uh, somebody wrote uh, since everybody's bragging on 10, 30, 20, 23, they paid a forty four thousand dollar towing invoice. Uh, here's a question: Will insurance fight the excesses? Do you have any? knowledge about that alex um the excesses as in uh, i guess beyond you know if, if insurance will only cover a certain amount and there there's excesses in there will insurance try to fight that down to what's covered oh. <laughs> okay right so you've got a towing limit let's say it's at thirty thousand, and the bill comes in at forty thousand or something like that right so you're you're on you're on on deck for that extra 10 or, or whatever it is, you know, that's going to depend on your insurer. Um, I, I don't have a one size fits all for that. Uh, you know, uh, and it's also, it's also going to depend on whether legal action gets involved. Uh, certainly something we see in the research we do on, uh, on lawsuits, liability, uh, plaintiff attorneys love to try to split insurers and carriers by by finding that you know where the policy breaks are uh so when you move into legal action i would say that the, you know you you are potentially looking at a greater risk there 
uh, but it's going to depend on your insurer. Alex, uh, we've kind of hit our hour limit here, and there's a few more comments here, but mostly uh, just commentary. Mm -hmm. One thing I did want to mention, and uh, you know, part of what you talked about is there is a requirement uh, for the drivers to get a little extra training about what to do uh, as far as getting pictures and not signing consent forms and different things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our company, by the way, we're all about... Uh, uh, training, and I just wanted to pop a little poll up here if anybody's interested in hearing a little bit more about what we do and how we could uh, provide uh, methods for you to get that kind of training and messages out to your drivers. Uh, just uh, answer the poll here, and we'll be happy to follow up with you and let you know what we could uh, uh, do to assist in that process. But uh, Alex, I have to tell you, this was... Uh, a load of really good information. And uh, you guys have provided a great resource, I think for our trucking customers and, and companies out there to uh, get that report that you produce. There's a lot of really good information in there that I think will help them. And uh, certainly uh, I wanna encourage all of you that joined the webinar today to support this organization, support ATRI, because uh, they really kind of uncover the information necessary for the industry to do something about these uh, problems and issues that you all have. So having said that, Alex, thank you so much for uh, your presentation today. Mark, did you have any final yeah, comments? Just real, yeah, what, real quick. Uh, do you find as a resource for relief that the, the truck state trucking organizations, associations or any help? Yeah, that's a great point, Mark. Uh, state truck associations are a good place to go to. Um, they, uh, you know, a number of them have been very active on this front. Maryland, Virginia, um, a lot of them have been active on trying to work regulations in, uh, but also, yeah, trying to help share information. So uh, if you've had an issue, if you're a member, certainly, that is a great place to go. And, and some of them will have a better idea, too, of uh, what some of those local regulations look like. It would have taken a team of many more researchers for us to compile all of that. The states, uh, some of them have. But that, that's, uh, a, that's a legitimate reach out for, for relief would be your, your trucking association in your state. The other comment I would make, uh, Steve, you already made, looks like a lot of at the scene custom content for your drivers on yeah. what to do and probably what not to do at the scene of an accident to include fuel spills, uh, you know, the pictures, the note sign, anything, those are all very trainable and, and something I would certainly recommend to our clients. If you don't, we, we've got some at the scene, um, can't have enough of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Alex, uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time uh, very much. This was, uh, you've seen a lot of thank yous in the chat there. So, uh, well done. Thank you for joining uh, us today. And thanks to all of our uh, trucking uh, uh, companies out there for joining us today, too. So uh, uh, appreciate y'all being here. Thank you again, Alex. And uh, we'll hope to catch all of you on our next webinar. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Thank you.